So I'm delighted now to have our afternoon begin with Dr. Connie Kellum, who is a professor of allergy and infectious diseases and global health uh, at the University of Washington and an adjunct professor of epidemiology at the same institution. She's also director of International Clinical Research Center at the University of Washington Department of Medicine's Department of Global Health, and is internationally known for her work uh, on the treatment and prevention of HIV and STDs. And she's going to uh, lead us today uh, in a discussion about uh, about PrEP. So, uh, Connie, without further ado, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to give a talk at uh, about being PrEP for PrEP, uh, and this will be very case-based and hopefully interactive, talking about what we have available now, but also giving some uh, look ahead at the future options. So I have um, participated in HIV prevention trials uh, for which we've received medication from Gilead, and I've served as a scientific advisor to Merck. So I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation we'll have a uh, be clear about who are the highest priority populations in the U.S. for uh, PrEP, how to counsel patients about how to take different uh, PrEP regimens, talk some about the impact of STIs on PrEP and the impact of PrEP on STIs, and then understanding, making sure that we're all understanding and hopefully counseling about U equals U. So this first slide tries to capture where we are in terms of the rates of new infections among adults and adolescents by sex and race and ethnicity um, using 2017 data in the U.S. and shows that on the left-hand set of histograms that the highest numbers are clearly among black and African-American men and uh, on the right also among females uh, with a much lower case rate, but still highest among um, black Americans. So that's where there obviously are other populations, Hispanics and Latinos and uh, multi-race individuals that we also need to be thinking about, but we have our work cut out to do a better job of delivering PrEP to these populations. And the numbers are going up in Asians and in uh, Latinos. Taking a global perspective for a moment, this is a slide I like a lot from PEPFAR because I think it shows uh, where we are, where we've been and where we're heading. And if you break it down by pediatric, young adults and older adults, you can see that we've made progress, um, slower progress um, clearly in the uh, far right in terms of persons who are 25 years and older, but we are making progress. But where we're actually losing ground is among uh, adolescents and young adults ages 15 to 24. And part of this has to do with demographics, that we are in a huge uh, demographic transition, particularly in Africa where there are growing numbers of uh, adolescents who are at risk of HIV and where we have not reduced HIV incidence, which is why the size of the gray um, circle is actually getting larger. So we really need to do much better than we have in that group. This is also a PEPFAR slide and shows in the dotted lines where what we could do with our numbers of new infections if we are able to scale up um, People on ART in blue, uh, medical male circumcisions in green, uh, and oral prep in sort of a gold color at the bottom, that if we could do all this on that scale, we would actually be looking at uh, sharp reductions in, in new HIV infections. But I can tell you just since we're talking about prep, that if you look at 2020, the projections were uh, 2 million, and we're still hovering about 500,000, so we are not close to what the targets were when this slide was developed two years ago. <clears throat> so we are doing better, I think, at treatment is prevention, but I think what we have learned in the last several years from some very large, ambitious trials of treatment is prevention in Botswana, Botswana South Africa, Kenya, Uganda and Zambia, that basically even when the targets of UNAIDS 
targets of 90% of people knowing their status, 90% of those uh, linking to care, and 90% viral suppression, that they had lower, at least short-term reductions in uh, population-level HIV incidence than we had predicted. It was not the 60% that these uh, large community-based trials had projected. It was really a 30% reduction. So I think it's not to say that treatment as prevention won't have a population level impact, but it's we need other forms of primary prevention as well. So we're um, we basically it's not an either or and we need to really avoid that kind of dichotomous thinking and do everything we can on scale up of HIV testing to populations who are not being reached, linkages to care, uh, simpler regimens, higher rates of viral suppression, and scale up primary prevention. So that's what we'll focus on in the rest of the talk. So the first ARS question is, do you start PrEP on the same day or wait for test results before prescribing PrEP? And the choices are same day, wait for lab results, or something else. Okay, so it looks like two-thirds said they would wait for lab results and one-third say they would uh, do it on the same day and a few people said something else. So why don't we um, hear from the panelists, what would you do? And then we'll talk about the data to um, argue one way or the other. So Eric, do you want to lead off and say what sure. you do? Sure. So, you know, so I'm not, I'm not as worried about getting the results of their creatinine or their hepatitis B status because I think for your most patients, unless they're particularly high risk for having underlying renal disease, um, for most patients that were looking at this, I, I'm happy to start therapy and have those things pending. I do want to have an HIV test back before I start. And if I can get that quickly, that would be great. If I can get a, a point of care test and the person has no signs or symptoms of acute infection, I'd be comfortable moving forward. The tension being that you know that if you don't get them started right away, you may never get them started. So it's always sort of balancing the relatively low risk of waiting for the labs or not waiting for the labs versus getting them on treatment early. So that's mostly the HIV test that I'm, I want to prioritize. Any other panelists uh, have a different opinion about this? We also start PrEP right away um, in our clinic. Uh, it's a two-hour turnaround time with the rapid HIV we actually let them leave, and then we'll call them with lots of information to tell them not to start. If, if, and, of course, we don't start if there's any um, signs or symptoms of acute HIV infection. Great. Great. Well, let's see what the data, um, and how the data inform us. There was a poster by Makati et al. from New York City presented in uh, the CROI 2019 that looked at this in sexual health clinics in between 2017 and 2018, and they had almost 1,500 PrEP candidates, and they did an initial screening to see if people had any history of kidney disease um, and or hepatitis B, any acute HIV signs and symptoms. And the first thing that jumps out is that almost 97% of people had no to all. And then uh, if you look below that on this uh, this next portion of the slide, that over 99% of the people, when they actually had the test results back, either were, had a low creatinine clearance or were HIV positive based on a NAT test. So that over 99% of 97% were totally safe to start an um, immediate PrEP. And if you look on the DPREP, standing for delayed PrEP, there were about 3% who fell into that category. And of those, um, only 14% were not eligible once they um, actually had the laboratory testing. And of those, the remainder, um, the 43 who were PrEP eligible, only a third started PrEP. So this is uh, the issue that, and I think both... Um, Dr. Dar and Dr. Gandhi highlighted aspects of that is that it's really um, for 
for most individuals, it's very safe to start. And I think in many parts of uh, the world, like Kenya, creatinine testing and hepatitis B testing are optional. We really don't want to delay PrEP starts if, if possible. So let's move on to another uh, ARS question. 34-year-old uh, man who has sex with other men um, and has new partners um, on a pretty frequent basis, um, but twice per month. He doesn't want to take a daily pill because his sexual exposure is relatively infrequent, but he doesn't always use condoms. So what would you do? Encourage him to use condoms? Or because you think his exposure is relatively low um, uh, compared to other patients in your panel, you tell him um, not to worry about PrEP, doesn't need it. Number three, encourage him to take daily PrEP, even though he would prefer not to take a daily pill. Number four, have him start PrEP seven days before sexual episodes. Or number five, prescribe on-demand PrEP or 211 PrEP, even though it is not FDA approved or endorsed by CDC. Okay, so um, it sounds like two-thirds would uh, recommend on-demand PrEP, and uh, about almost 30% would encourage him to take daily PrEP. How about the panelists? So I would definitely say that there's a couple of answers here that are poor. Um, I think uh, in, he's relatively low risk. Don't worry about it is a bad answer because he's clearly – at substantial risk. And I think starting prep seven days before sexual episodes is just not feasible or practical. So, you know, I think encouraging him to use condoms is great, but probably not in isolation. Um, and it would probably be two or five. And he would be the perfect candidate for a 211 prep based on his current sexual activities. And if that's something he feels that he can navigate as part of his sexual life, that he may be the perfect person for it. And although it's not FDA approved and it's not yet CDC endorsed, um, they haven't updated their guidelines in a while. I don't know if that's going to change at some point. Um, certainly the data is fairly robust that this is a good strategy. So I'd probably, based on what he's telling me, be thinking number five. Thanks. Any other comments? I would just say that the fact that 211 is endorsed by IS, IAS USA um, and also uh, endorsed by many governing guidelines, this is really the strategy. And in France, this is uh, the SF Department of Public Health that here in San Francisco um, listed as a recommended agent. So I think it's just increasingly getting approval because of what Eric said, the Ipergay and Ipergay Ole, and um, just really great um proof that uh, using this strategy for infrequent sex, two doses before sex, one dose after 24 hours after, and another dose 48 hours after really does work. Great. Agree with both. Doesn't of work you. with TAF FTC, though. I mean, we don't know about it. So. And, and for men only. Right. Exactly. So let's go over the data just to make sure people are aware of this. Uh, as Dr. Gandhi said, Ypergay was a study conducted primarily in France, but also in Montreal, uh, Quebec. And the regimen that they did, and they did this as a placebo-controlled trial um, while the data were being reviewed by FDA and other bodies for daily regimen, but they were pretty convinced that uh, event-driven e-prep, as they called it, intermittent prep, was a regimen worth testing because it would be fewer fewer pills if people... Um, if it worked, but knew, no one knew whether it worked, and there were a lot of strong opinions. But the regimen was to take two tablets of TDF-FTC, or in the trial, it, obviously they could have been randomized to placebo, two to 24 hours before sex, a tablet after, within 24 hours after sex, and a tablet 48 hours after their first sex. And if they had ongoing sex on a daily basis, then they would continue the daily dosing as long as they had sex. Um, so that was the regimen and what they found in the top two rows of this table. During the placebo control trial, they found um, very uh, striking reduction in uh, the TDF FTC arm. And so the actually the Data Safety Monitoring Board re recommended that they stop the trial stop the placebo arm 
early, and they then included, offered them the uh, TDF-FTC and the open label uh, part of the study after the these results were made public. And you can see that they had really dramatically uh, low incidence, less than 0.2% percent compared to 6.6 during the placebo arm and the median follow-up duration in the open label time was uh, almost 18 months so not a trivial amount of time and what they reported was a 97 percent relative reduction with event-driven TDF FTC compared to placebo so this really caught um, a lot of attention in particularly in Europe, and the U.S. has been slower to adopt it. So some people say, well, how much did people actually take? And the median number of pills was 18 per month. And what's interesting is when you think about 18 pills per month, that averages about four pills per per week, which is very similar to what they found in the IPREX Olay study, where with four doses per week, and this, is, again, was in the open-label efficacy, so everyone knew they were on active um, FTC TDF, the estimated efficacy was uh, 96%, so way over, um, you know, over 90% for sure. And so this has become the um, more accepted that for for people who can take uh, daily prep well, defined as at least four pills per week, that their eff- efficacy should be very high. But intermittent uh, event-driven dosing is an alternative for people, particularly if they have um, less frequent sex. So after the primary EPRGA results were presented, people started saying, well, what you know, how much data did Ypergay have about people who had less frequent sex? So they did a, a secondary analysis after the initial results were released, and they looked at the participants who had um, less use, so took less than 15 pills per month, and uh, reported using se- PrEP during sexual intercourse. And what they found in their um, sub-analysis is that um, – Basically, they had no infections in the TDF FTC arm compared to placebo. So it worked, um, obviously, with uh, small numbers and not much person year follow up, but there were no infections in people who used it uh, even less than the average, who used it less than 15 pills per month. So it seems like it would be a very good regimen for this per, uh, the person we just spoke about. As Dr. Dar said, the CDC continues to recommend daily PrEP. They are con, uh, reviewing the data for 211 PrEP, and I think ideally would like data from U.S. populations, but uh, it's not clear that that's actually going to be put into uh, uh, another trial. So I'm glad that IAS USA has recommended 211 PrEP as an alternative to daily PrEP. And I think as clinicians and providers, we should be asking questions about how about people's sexual behavior and is it um, typically the case that they can plan ahead around the weekends or when they're um, meeting new partners, are they able to at least have two hours um, planning time for pre-doses? Are they able to do intermittent dosing? Some people find it easier to just do something once a day rather than thinking about um, where they are in the 211 course. And will they use it with all partners? And again, I think Dr. Dar rec- uh, mentioned this that this regimen, 211 regimen, has never been studied in women and uh, or in persons who inject drugs. So um, this is not recommended for uh, either of those groups. So when you're thinking about who can use 211 versus daily prep, um, again, just to highlight that it's only been studied in uh, MSM, where, whereas we have very robust data for daily prep in all in cis and and to some extent trans women as well as injection drug users. There's always been a, a concern due to the black box warning about uh, hepatitis B flares with um, tenofovir and emtricitabine used for prep. Um, actually, it has not panned out to be an issue with daily prep. There is a 
a greater concern when you're using it intermittently that you might see these kind of flares with uh, hepatitis B. So that is another thing to uh, factor in. Planning, can they plan sex at least two hours in advance, whereas um, there isn't planning needed uh, for daily prep? And I think another issue to consider is just the so-called forgiveness. And we don't know as much as we'd like to know about how long you have um, protective levels in cells and in plasma after missing doses, but clearly it will be shorter with um, the 211 dosing. So what's actually been happening in other parts of the world where it has been promulgated as a reasonable alternative? And in France, where the studies were done, uh, slightly over half of MSM chose a ventriven prep, uh, almost half in uh, a Belgian context where they are doing large-scale implementation of prep, and about a quarter of MSM in the Amsterdam cohort. So it's fairly commonly selected in Europe. And we've seen that um, in that context, there's also a um, a substantial minority will go between daily and event-driven prep. And I think the reason why we're not um, enthusiastic about it in other contexts is that particularly in the context of a well-done randomized trial among MSM in Bangkok and New York and young women in Cape Town, that um, in Bangkok there was enough ability for young men to plan their sex um, and their event-driven prep, so they actually had very high coverage of um, sex acts with the event-driven prep, but that was not the case either in MSM from Harlem or young women in Cape Town, hence we don't recommend it. So let's move on to another case. Um, Now have a 48-year-old MSM uh, who has hypertension. He's coming in requesting PrEP. He has multiple partners, frequent sex, and frequent STI, so he sounds like a good candidate for PrEP. Um, His creatinine is slightly elevated, um, and his creatinine clearance is um, uh, really on the cusp of what we would feel comfortable with in terms of using um, tenofovir. So what would you do? Prescribe daily tenofovir FTC, prescribe daily TAP FTC, prescribe every other day TDF FTC, prescribe 211 PrEP, which we just spoke about, or tell him not to use PrEP because um, not so much that he's not at risk, but because he has so many STIs that we don't think it'll work. So why don't we poll the audience and then discuss it amongst the panel. Okay, so a very high percentage, about 82%, say they would do prescribe daily TAP FTC and a small but not negligible 10% say they would do 211 prep. So let's see what our panelists think. I'll I'll go first. I think um you know, so this is a this is the kind of person that when our only option was TDFFTC, I would have definitely gone for it, but with close follow up and trepidation. But he's clearly at extremely high risk, and we can follow people for toxicity of TDFFTC. So I would have done it, but he's the, this is the kind of person you'd worry about. And TAF FTC comes along, and I think we have every reason to believe that it's going to be gentler on the kidneys and also at least, you know, our experience in treated patients uh, with HIV, we can go down to a creatinine clearance of less than 30 mils per minute. So, so two it is a great advantage, I think, over one in somebody like this. And there's an open debate as we start to think about pricing, um, whether in somebody who is otherwise healthy with normal renal function, whether those benefits are justified, but certainly um, in this case, number two offers huge advantages. I think um, the, number three we would be doing in the absence of a lot of data except the model data that you provided that suggested you could probably get away with it. Um, and then 211 in somebody who's having frequent sex, essentially they'll be on TDFFTC every day. So you don't get the real benefit from 211 in somebody like this. Uh, and certainly... I encourage him to use condoms for STIs, but prep will work in this setting. So in this case, I think there's a couple of reasonable answers, but I think two is far and away the best. 
I I would just add, and this is maybe foreshadowing for your future, but um, I um, that I, I totally agree that TAF can be used to 30 uh, mils per minute with creatinine, and that is the approved amount. But this is someone has risk factors for renal insufficiency, and it could go fast. He has hypertension, he's older, and it really is this patient population yeah. that has higher levels of tenofovir, even with TAF, the plasma levels. So I would hope, we'll talk about this, but, but, but for another option for this patient for PrEP in the future, because I would even be worried with this degree of renal insufficiency about TAF. Um, but it's clearly the right answer on this particular slide set. Great. But I, I do strongly object to your characterization of him being older. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I just want to put that on, on record. Oh, thank you for bringing that up for those of us who are on the other side of 48. <laughs> uh, so let's review the data. And just here, I'm not going to go into a lot of um, detail other than to highlight that, as Dr. Gandhi just said, that really the data that we have suggests that those who have a uh, greater risk of tenofovir um, based renal toxicity are those who have a lower um, estimated creatinine clearance to begin, those who are over the 40 to 50 years of age. Um, we found that also in the Partners PrEP and Partners Demo project that we led in uh, Uganda and Kenya, and there found that lower weight was also a risk factor. But we also found that a high proportion of um, sort of modest creatinine increases were not confirmed on a repeat test. So there is variability within individuals. And um, and we also found that in that context where there is a pretty high prevalence of high blood pressure that we did not find up, find that there was any um, benefit to doing every three versus every six-month testing, that um, it was rare enough that we um, felt comfortable saying every six-month testing was um, was adequate. Um, in the Thai injection drug user study, uh, there was no effect of recent injection drug use on creatinine, and there was more, um, again, an association of renal insufficiency with age. And the other thing that across all trials we found is that after PrEP was stopped, the creatinine reverts to um, to their baseline. So, and there are examples from um, trials and subsequently in demonstration projects that you can re-challenge people with PrEP and not have problems. Just to make sure that people are aware of the DISCOVER trial that was um, presented as a late breaker at CROI in 2019. This was a large trial of um, almost a uh, little over 5,000 primarily MSM with a small number of transgender women who are either randomized to get FTAF or FTDF every day. And these were men who were primarily recruited from private practices um, in 11 countries. And um, they looked at, the trial was designed to look at uh, non-inferiority of FTAF and FTDF. And what they reported is that they um, met their non-inferiority um, criteria. The incidence was, again, quite low, that you had um, 0.34 uh, incidence per 100 person years in the FTDF and 0.16 in the uh, FTAF. So that um, applying the statistical uh, criteria for non-inferiority, it did um, meet non-inferiority. So some people have, you know, I think that it's not always um, easy to explain non-inferiority to um, people, but it's not that it's superior, um, but it's that they are comparable in terms of the protection afforded against HIV. If you put these two side by side and say, what do we know and where might there be an indication for thinking about FTAF versus um, um, F, uh, FTC, PDF, it is, that, as we've heard, uh, hopefully through the news coverage, that that was only studied in MSM in a small number of transgender women. Um, there will be a trial of FTAF in African women, but that probably won't happen until 2021. And there are no plans that I'm aware of to do a study in uh, persons who inject. So we have a gap of data there. Um, Safety is the thing that gets um, discussed a lot. There's a small um, difference uh, in uh, 
between the two uh, drugs in terms of creatinine clearance and bone mineral density, lipids, and um, body weight. So these are all things to factor in. So I I would have agreed with that patient that uh, FTAF would be the, the best option. So let's go on to another case, just trying to be mindful of time. We have a 29-year-old um, man who's negative, HIV negative, has multiple partners, and he's um, asking about the recent news about injectable PrEP. And since Dr. Gandhi mentioned this, it's um, perfect timing. And he wants to know, he heard about it through um, social media, and he wants to know, is it um, better than oral PrEP? Quote, better. So what do you say? You could give, tell him that injectable cabotegravir, which is the drug he's talking about, is superior to uh, daily oral PrEP, tell them that it is non-inferior to oral PrEP, or tell them that you don't know as only the press release is available and you'll get back to them after the results are published. Well, I think those are both very reasonable answers that the press release did say that it... um, Injectable cabotegravir every two months is uh, non-inferior to oral PrEP, um, but it is a press release, and um, some of us are, uh, would like to have more information uh, about some of the data, and hopefully that will be forthcoming soon. So what are the panelists think? I, I completely agree with this audience that uh, it is a press release, um, even though that's what it said in We'll wait for the data, and I'll just put in a plug that the data will be presented on July 8th um, in, at AIDS 2020, uh, and we're super excited about it uh, at the co-chairs meeting. And then I think the that morning that it will be released, and I think it, it will be very exciting to actually see the data. Just like COVID, we want to see data and not press releases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously it's a pretty exciting finding. I'm it's sort of a little disappointing as we sit and walk through this and think about all of the advances for MS for men, uh, none of which yet can be applied to women. Um, but there is the study in women that hopefully won't be too far behind this to provide women with additional op- options other than just TDF, FTC. Yep. Thank you. Thank you both. And just to make sure people are aware of um, where we are, um, there are clear advantages to going to longer-acting um, PrEP agents, and um, in the case of injectable, could be dosed uh, every two to three months, and at least with uh, cabotegravir. And then um, the opportunity in many parts of the world where DMPA or NetN are the main forms of uh, long-acting hormonal contraception that really provides an a, a, advantage for the women as well as for healthcare systems to be able to offer these uh, at the same visits. Because of the long half-life and the fact that you can't remove it once you um, administer it into the gluteal muscles, um, one of the big questions will be in the trials, I did a one-month uh, lead-in with the oral cabotegravir to make sure there was not toxicity. So will that be the way it um, is licensed? And I think an even greater concern is just whether or not you're going to have to recommend oral PrEP after they discontinue injectable cabotegravir because of the very long tail um, and if people miss uh, visits. And the long tail is was reported um, at, uh, by Rafi Landovitz, and these are the data. The tail appears to be longer in women than men with a 66-week um, detectable cabotegravir levels after the last injection in women and 43 weeks in men. So not a trivial tail. And I think these are these questions or things that we're hoping we'll hear more about um, hopefully next week. Uh, and the trial that provided these data are, is known as HPT-083, which was a trial in MSM who are randomized to, it was a double blind, double dummy trial. So half the group, half the participants received um, active cabotegravir, initially oral for a week, for a month, and then the injectable every eight weeks, and then The other half of the participants received uh, oral daily prep and cab placebo. 
and uh, they did at the end for 48 weeks do daily dosing of oral um, FTC, uh, I'm sorry, um, FTC TDF to cover the tail. So the results that were uh, released by press release is that for almost 4,600 cisgender MSM and transgender women who had uh, sex with men were included. The average age was 28 years, so this is a little older um, population than um, some populations that are presenting for PrEP, but still still pretty young. And they, the DSMB met in mid-May for a planned interim analysis and stopped the blinded phase of the trial because they met the non-inferiority endpoint. Again, the overall incidence of HIV was less than 1%. It was 0.89. And there were 12 infections in the cabotegravir arm and 38 in the uh, TDF-FTC arm. There were more injection site reactions in the um, cabotegravir arm, not surprisingly. Um, and But, however, only 2% of uh, participants discontinued due to the injection uh, reactions. So very promising, exciting, and something to consider hopefully in the not-too-distant future for MSM, and we'll, we eagerly await the data in women. So let's move on to another case. We have a 29-year-old HIV-negative male patient who was diagnosed with secondary syphilis who had um, presented with a rash, a macular rash, pretty characteristic of uh, secondary syphilis and myalgias. He is interested in starting PrEP and but wants to know whether PrEP will work for him due to his syphilis diagnosis. So what would you do? Would you wait for his syphilis titers to drop fourfold and document that he's had effective treatment for syphilis? syphilis? Would you tell him that PrEP is not as effective if someone has uh, syphilis? Would you tell him that PrEP works in the presence of uh, syphilis in his case? Prescribe PrEP that day and call him back with labs? Would you because it's a rash, you might be worried about acute HIV. Would you wait for the HIV, RNA, or something else? Okay, so pretty even split between um, saying that PrEP works, don't worry about the secondary syphilis, and go ahead and prescribe it, not, not, not so much not to worry about it, but not to worry about PrEP effectiveness in that context. Um, and do same-day PrEP prescription versus waiting for HIV RNA. And I think both are reasonable um, ideas, uh, approaches. Do the panelists have anything to comment? I would say I'm wondering if um, wait for HIV RNA is a good um, answer here because there was a concern that I hope it's secondary syphilis, but um, certainly myalgias and rash could be an acute HIV syndrome. So it could be like confounding the question if he could have acute HIV at the same time. Yeah. So I think that was a really good thought by the audience. But in general, PrEP does work in the setting of STIs. It's actually adherence is its main determinant of efficacy, and it definitely works with uh, concomitant infections, including probably COVID-19. <laughs> Great. Just going to note that we're at uh, pretty much at our time up for the presentation. We should move on um, unless you have something essential left, Connie, to our Q and A. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to be watching the. Uh, we've been people have been so engaged in uh, Connie's um, uh, case discussion. There have been only a couple of uh, Q and A questions. One is. Um, what would the panel do uh, in someone uh, with PrEP with impaired renal function with a GFR less than 61, uh, the example that was given? Um, split FTT, uh, split into separate components or do either or both? Anybody have any thoughts about that? So give them a creatinine clearance of 30, Connie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would, um, I guess I would go ahead with F half and just really encourage them to um, hydrate and walk and they were I would follow their creatinine more frequently actually than we is recommended I would check it in a, a month and then I guess if his creatinine goes up that would be a hard hard call hopefully um, 
will have injectable cabotegravir soon. But and I guess you'd have to at that point if if his creatinine went up and there's no other alternative, um, maybe a try event driven prep. If but it, I would, you know, it's not a great alternative. So. I think you'd have to weigh his risks and if he really, um, how does and involve him in the discussion about whether his, he's able to use condoms more or do something else until we have a, a renal sparing prep option. And someone has heard that Kaiser is using SimDuo for prep. Any thoughts about that as an off-label uh, approach? Hmm. I, um, not sure that I, I'm not, I wasn't aware of that. So I guess um, I'm not a big fan in this situation of using something off label without um, more data, but I don't know if Dr. Gandhi or Dr. Dar have opinions. My um, uh, completely agree that there's no data on that. And I will say that Tenofovir I think is the more efficacious agent over 3TC, as we've seen um, in the CAC studies in patients who have M184V. So I kind of want that to know who we're in there in terms of wanting to study and dolotegravir and 3TC alone. Um, we just don't know. Yeah, we don't have that data. There are, we didn't have time to cover it, but just to say that there are uh, a number of exciting strategies to using like integrase inhibitors like elvotegravir for potentially PEP as well as potentially PrEP for people who have frequent exposures. So I think that we'll have other options in the, hopefully other options in the future. So in the chat uh, uh, chain, there is a disavowal of some duo from Kaiser. <laughs> so just want to make sure that uh, we, we stop the rumors out here. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. Um so why don't we tell people on daily prep to wait four weeks after a risky exposure to stop the medication uh, if they want to stop, given the experience with two one one dosing? Why? Um, I don't know. Do we really tell people on daily prep to wait 40, four weeks after a risky exposure to stop? Um, I mean, I, I think the um, data suggests that you – Basically, you have pretty negligible levels after seven days. So I, I think that we shouldn't be um, waiting for, you know, telling people to wait four weeks. Um, so it it accumulates and you have levels for, you probably don't need to wait seven days to get levels high enough to for protection, but I also think that you lose it pretty fast. So I do think it's reasonable to... Um, to tell people that if they if they really had a high risk exposure that they should continue it longer than just for um, for a few days. Okay. I think a lot of the uh, one month follow up started back about a hundred years ago when we used to get people <laughs> AZT for a needle stick, and um, exactly. it's not the kind of study that uh, people will do um, twenty eight days versus twenty one days versus fourteen days. Um, so. These things get hard to change. Um, yeah. Let's see. I'm looking through the uh, Q and A's. Am I missing some that we haven't touched? There are a lot of them about renal function. Uh, some about um, hypertension and indirect inferences about renal function because of age. Other themes here, um, Monica. Since you can see it as well, but we've missed. Yeah. Um... I think you've gotten them all. Someone was very concerned about that patient getting treated for secondary syphilis. Yes, of course. <laughs> they did. Um, and somebody's asking in a non-study situation about 2 on one how many will take the tabs and then wait two hours? Um, that's, yeah. Because um, it has to be taken 2 to 24 hours, right? Before right, right. In the... And I, you know, I think that if you look at the publication, the Lancet paper about Ypergate, it is so hard to really dissect the adherence data. It's very, it's based on self-report basically, but 
obviously whatever they were doing and you would, they were an older population. So the older, sorry, Dr. Dar, the 38, um, median age, they were able to probably, um, perhaps plan better. They were pretty high, uh, high, very high proportion of college education and whether or not this is generalizable to other populations. I think we, um, we don't know, but, um, However, they were dosing it in that context. It had very, very high efficacy. So I think that one of the things we're learning as we do more prep is that people are probably better than we recognize at understanding when they're at risk and using things effectively. We've, we didn't have a chance to talk about it with women, but for a long time we did not use, uh, there was a lot of ambivalence about PrEP in young African women because of the clinical trials. And we're seeing HIV incidence rates in some of the demonstration projects of less than 1%, even in the context of taking it an average of four doses a week. So Mm -hmm. I think the general feeling is we should trust our patients to um, know their risk and, and that they will use it when they need to use it. Encourage them to take it daily, but um, be prepared that, Adherence will not be perfect. It is pretty is amazing when you look at oh, just when you look at the, those two last big trials of over ten thousand people. I think cumulatively there may have been seventy infections. Mm-hmm. The infection rate is really low for at least yeah. people in these clinical trials. Right. Exactly. There's one last question here about uh, event-driven um, using uh, event-driven uh, prophylaxis using FTEF. Sorry, um, about, yeah, the data. Oh, oh. Yeah. I, I think people are interested in, uh, that study being done, but I, to my knowledge, it's not actually, uh, planned. So I would not personally, um, use event driven prep with FTAF. I, you know, I, I like data to guide my decisions. Makes sense. All right. Well, I want to thank you for a great uh, discussion and for everybody's in, engagement in the question-answer period and uh, in the um, questions as we went through this.